very good morning to all of you. Um, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Vinesh. I'm um, a faculty in Isa Thiruvanathavaram, and also I happen to be the, the president of uh, the Magnetic Resonance Society in Kerala. Uh, in this difficult time, I hope you and uh, your family are staying safe and uh, healthy. I hope by attending these um, web, uh, webinars, especially in magnetic resonance, exciting um, topic, magnetic resonance, uh, that will help to distract from the gloomy circumstances we find ourselves in. Uh, with that, I welcome all of you to the inaugural session of the webinar series, Magnetic Resonance, uh, Theory, App Applications, and Practice. Uh, this uh, webinar is jointly organized by Srinivas and Ramarajan Institute of Basic Sciences and uh, Magnetic Resonance Society, Kerala. A warm welcome to all members and um, executive members of MRSK. Um, I also um, extend a warm welcome to Dr. Arnan Sir from Ramanujan Institute and other officials from those from the same institute who help us to bring this uh, web, uh, webinar series. Um, MRSK has been set up to provide an opportunity, basically a platform to bring together uh, the scientists, the teachers, and the students of Magnetic Resonance in Kerala. The main motivation is to exchange ideas, collaborate, as well as uh, and popularize different aspects of uh, magnetic uh, resonance. Uh, with this in mind, this is our first um, endeavor to showcase the different aspects of uh, magnetic resonance. Uh, we start the web series with the basics of magnetic resonance that involves 1D, 2D, and also solid state enema. Then we go to magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, and uh, last but not least, to electron pyramidic resonance. We have a number of very distinguished faculties and scientists delivering these talks. On behalf of the organizing committee, I welcome all the speakers to this webinar and also thank them personally for accepting our invitation uh, for, uh, for delivering these lectures. I encourage all the participants to ask questions in the seminar. Many times it is very uh, small misunderstanding that uh, could potentially lead to not understanding anything in the uh, seminar. <laughs> Once that part is understood, when that particular understood part is understood in the right way, then clarity of thoughts um, happen or follows. So I urge all the participants to ask questions and clear your doubts. Uh, success of this seminar series depends entirely uh, on how much you understood. So please take active part in the discussions. Do not be afraid to ask questions. Again, on behalf of MRSK and our Management Institute, I welcome all the participants to this webinar. And hopefully, uh, you will learn something new and also enjoy the lectures for the next couple of days. Uh, finally, I would like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Paradwaj Satyaburti from ISA Bhopal. Uh, Parath, uh, let me introduce him uh, before he starts his seminar. Um, Parath did his master's from IIT Madras, uh, following which uh, he went to US for his PhD with Professor Thomas Sipersky in Buffalo. Uh, Thomas Sipersky's group uh, works on accelerated um, uh, acquisition methods in NMR. On completion of his PhD, Bharat joined Professor Hashim Al Hashimi's lab in Michigan. Professor uh, Hashim's lab is a is a pioneer in NMR-based nucleic acid research. Bharat did a lot of good work there, which earned him a faculty position in Isa Bhopal. Bharat uh, group in Isa Bhopal works on very challenging problem in structural biology, mainly uh, determining novel folds of DNA using NMR. Um, unlike uh, proteins. Uh, DNA is quite a difficult thing to work with NMR uh, uh, because the number of resonances, I mean, very crowded, the region is very crowded. So it's a very challenging problem. He's also known to be a very good teacher. Uh, with this, I welcome to deliver the lecture. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, before uh, Bharat begins, I just wanted to tell you that uh, please uh, switch off your uh, mics during the seminar. If you have any doubts, please uh, put it in the chat box. And during the discussion, we can, or when he asks for any questions, please uh, uh, put it through. Okay, thank you very much. Bharat. 
Uh, thank you very much for the very kind introduction, Vinesh. Uh, I think you just put a lot of pressure by saying that I'm a good teacher. So let's see how this goes. Um, let me first of all welcome all the student participants and also the faculty from all over Kerala who are trying to attend and actually uh, do something great for the Magnetic Resonance Society. Uh, first of all, I really appreciate that Vinesh uh, and of course a lot of uh, Magnetic Resonance enthusiasts from Kerala has uh, come through with this society of this sort. I'm guessing this is first of its kind in the entire country and uh, I have seen such endeavors in the U.S. being extremely uh, popular, successful in making sure uh, that magnetic resonance seeps through undergraduate, postgraduate, and also PhD students. And this is extremely important. And in this aspect, I'm extremely proud that uh, you guys have started something like this. And when Minesh uh, said, would you like to give a talk, I was more than happy to do this. And I'm mo I'll be even more happy uh, to participate in any of the uh, uh, endeavors that you guys uh, work on especially regarding magnetic resonance. So this is a fantastic endeavor. I request all the students and all the faculty from universities to make the best use of it. Um, and uh, the best part of this is that you guys have a uh, good range of it. You have back NMR, uh, you have NMR spectroscopy, you have MRI, you have EPR, and applications of EPR. And uh, truth be told, the schedule that has been put through for this basic session for the next uh, three days is really tight and spans a large uh, spectrum by itself. Uh, I just hope uh, students make the best use of it. And as Vinesh has just mentioned, do not feel uh, shy to ask questions. Um, I am somebody who encourages questions so that the discussion goes both ways. And I also understand what went through from my teaching and what did not. So kindly don't feel hesitated. Uh, at positions where my voice is not clear, if there's a video breakage or anything, Please stop and turn on the mic and uh, let me know. And in case Vinish, uh, my internet has completely gone and I'm still talking, please give me a call on the phone. Uh, I'll switch on to other internet resources and I'll be able to carry on forward. Uh, and then um, to add one more thing, I hope all of you are keeping safe right now. Uh, it would have been a great pleasure visiting Kerala at this point of time. I always have good memories of being there. Uh, it's sad that I couldn't make it personally, but I'm sure uh, uh, over a period of time, this is going to keep happening and I'll be more than happy to visit you all. Uh, so with that, let me get started. Uh, a few instructions here and the way I have constructed my lecture for today. Uh, basically, we'll start in trying to understand what is spectroscopy. And then as we go on, we'll try to understand, understand some intricate things in spectroscopy. Uh, from Dr. Sunil Kumar, I came to know that this is a mixed audience of undergrad, postgrad, and also probably PhD students, and also some faculty who might be around. So in this regard, what might end up happening is that I may not give you all the specific details of uh, what we are, uh, I mean, what is NMR spectroscopy. I'll give you a broadest of strokes that will help you understand all the uh, lectures that follow mine as well, uh, my lecture as well. So um, if people require some detail or would like to learn in more uh, advanced detail, I'll give you a few resources that is going to be extremely helpful for you at the end of this discussion so that you can take it from there. So please uh, uh, have this in mind that I'm trying to pitch this idea to undergrad to postgrad kind of audience and not for the most advanced of NMR audience. And of course, you can always take it up. I'm sure Vinesh will organize one more session later on for advanced uh, NMR uh, aspects as well. And what is going to end up happening is that I've joined from two places. One is from my laptop, the other is from my tablet. I'll be presenting from my tablet because I believe in writing and showing things. Uh, and as I say go forward, I might end up taking a break for every 10 to 15 minutes. So I request break in the sense like I'll break for questions. Uh, there is a nice hand raise option, raise hand option in Gmeet. I'm going to do that right now. So when I do that, uh, if you go to the chat window or even to the participants window, you will see that I have raised hand. Now I see that Saad has also raised his hand. So if you guys want to play with it right now, play with it to make sure that you know how to raise your hand. And if the hand raise does come up, and by chance, I miss. Yeah, I see Sichana raising. That's very good. So uh, please go ahead. Don't feel shy. Uh, Jeet also raised his hand. Now I see Jeet is around. Um, so Jeet will be talking about basics of 2D NMR. So now coming back, uh, uh, please feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions. Uh, I'll stop at the appropriate moment. And if I'm not stopping, I request uh, Vinish, the chair, to let me know that I'm missing something. So feel free to ask questions during the lecture or in the break that I end up giving. Uh, so without much further ado, 
let me actually get started. Um, just a moment. Okay, I hope my uh, slides are visible right now. I'm turning off my video just to ensure that uh, things look clear. Uh, so, Vinish, uh, could you please confirm whether yeah, my fine. voice uh, slides are also okay? Good. All right. Yeah, good. Uh, so, uh, as, as I already started with this, I really appreciate that Kerala has a beautiful endeavor. Uh, the Magnetic Resonance Society in India is also very active. We have, um, we used to have weekly uh, webinars that used to happen, which will kickstart again, uh, I, I guess, very soon. Um, and uh, we have Jeet and uh, Vinesh who are a part of it. Okay. Without much further ado, let me get started with the topic for today. What is spectroscopy? I'm sure as students, you guys would be exposed to the topic of spectroscopy at multiple different levels at different points of time. The basic definition of spectroscopy is one where you define it as the interaction of matter with, li uh, sorry, light with matter. And what we mean by matter here is something like your sample. So as chemists or biologists, what we tend to do is to prepare samples. And then we put it through different spectroscopic techniques, interrogating how they look. You might imagine, you can imagine each type of spectroscopy gives a certain fingerprint for a given molecule, meaning that you can never characterize a human being just with one given characteristic, for instance, height or weight or you know any of the eye color or hair color. It's very difficult to characterize a human being just with one parameter. Spectroscopy is also like that. You cannot do a single type of spectroscopy and then expect to have characterized that molecule. So given that premise, uh, the important thing for us to understand here is that multiple different types of spectroscopy come handy for scientists in order to make sure they have synthesized the right molecule or what kind of molecule they are looking at when it comes to structure and dynamics. Once the molecule is prepared, the molecule has a certain set of characteristics, which is what we are trying to uh, get from its fingerprint. For instance, basically, what I mean to say is that there are going to be two energy levels that end up coming, at least two energy levels that are to be present in the molecule. So as to ensure that there is a population difference between these two, I'll be explaining more of this as we go forward. The moment you have a population difference, let's assume a both span type of distribution, which is the most common, what will end up happening, you will be applying, you will be applying an electromagnetic radiation so as to end up changing the population from the lower energy state to the higher energy state. And when such a thing has happened, what will end up happening is that instead of having P1, um, let's say much greater than P2, you might have a situation where P1 is similar to P2, where the populations are almost equal to each other. In that condition, what happens is that the population starts, or rather the equilibration after the excitation starts to happen, and therefore this will end up releasing uh, a certain, certain signal, which you end up capturing with any type of a camera. The moment you capture it, you process it in a certain way, so as to obtain your fingerprint, which is called the spectrum of a given molecule. And as I just said, I might end up using certain specialized term as perturbation where your electromagnetic radiation is the perturbation that you end up using to interrogate between these energy levels. What these energy levels are, we'll be talking in a moment. And the populations, of course, are decided by the energy of each of the state one and two. And we also specify non-degenerate energy levels, largely because if you have two degenerate energy levels, their populations will be equal irrespective of whatever happens and you may not be able to interrogate. We'll not be going into such complicated uh, cases uh, uh, in this given lecture, but that sets the premise uh, for people to understand what is spectroscopy. Basically, it's the interaction of light with matter, where matter is your sample, and we probe the system by applying certain radiations so as to understand how things work out. You might immediately ask, why is that you need to perturb a system? Perturbation basically means a disturbance. It is something like this. If you want to measure your body temperature, the thing that we do is to put a thermometer, right? You stick a thermometer in your mouth and you try to wait for a certain amount of time and then 
catch up the reading from the thermometer and assess whether you have fever or not so basically this can also be thought about as a measurement where your thermometer is kind of the instrument that measures it instead of a em radiation here you have something uh, as a thermometer which has mercury in it it tries to equilibrate with your body temperature so basically what ends up happening the heat difference in your body gets transferred to the thermometer and then it rises to a certain extent where you are able to see uh, what is the act, the thermometer in your body equilibrate and after that you take the thermometer out and you try to see what is the reading so that gives you an understanding of what kind of state that you are in so disturbing something to make a measurement is very very common in science and that's essentially what you do in spectroscopy so now what is molecular spectroscopy i just mentioned many things here light heat and matter let's take a quick look at what is light light is actually nothing but an electromagnetic radiation where electrical and magnetic vectors that are mutually perpendicular to each other are present and we end up uh, using it to interrogate your system so for instance what you see here is the three dimensional representation of what is an electromagnetic radiation so if you are able to observe there are two vectors one that is pointing let's assume this is the z axis just for the sake of completeness and uh, what you are able to see is that you are able to see a vector along the z axis and another vector along of course z or minus z axis this is minus z and you have something along the um, x axis plus x or minus x axis and and these are nothing but the uh, electrical I'm sorry about these messages keep, uh, that keep on coming. Uh, this is nothing but the electrical and magnetic field vectors that are present, which are perpendicular to one another, which results in the EM radiation. As you are able to see, it's a helix uh, that ends up coming largely because you have mutually orthogonal vectors that are present, and when you add them in three dimensions, you are actually going to have uh, something of this sort that is represented in the red color. Uh, uh helix that that you end up seeing here now the energy of these radiations span a large range once again this is called the electromagnetic spectrum and this gives you an idea of what is the strength of the light that you are using i just gave a simple example of using a thermometer to measure your temperature but there are other invasive and non invasive ways of measuring temperature uh which could we talk about as different energies that we end up using and also this ends up giving different information at different part from different parts of your body so basically the higher the energy that ends up uh, being used for this electromagnetic radiation it ends up disturbing different energy levels that are present in the molecule and on top of it it could also end up being a uh, little invasive meaning that it could end up disturbing the molecule to an extent where it doesn't remain what it was when you started it i'm sure all of you are familiar with x rays whenever you would like to get an image of a bone done what you end up doing is to go to a uh, diagnostic center and try to get x ray done for your hand or chest or anything to understand how does it look the important thing is that you don't frequent to the x ray a place largely because the energy that it ends up using is quite significant i'd like to mention that on the top you have the frequency and on the bottom you have the wavelength these are just inverse of one another um so basically they are just representing the same thing in different units and i'd like to uh, quickly emphasize that e equal to h nu or hc by lambda so as you are able to see uh, nu and lambda are inversely proportional uh, and energy and frequency are directly proportional to each other so higher the frequency higher the energy lower the lambda higher the energy and as you are able to see of all the radiations that are present here the x ray comes up quite high in the energy so due to which people say you should not be frequenting to the x ray uh, lab to get anything done so you should not keep keep on taking too many x rays on the other hand you also see other type of radiations which we also end up experiencing in every life uh, every day life for instance the uv light is something that's always present from the sun although not at very high intensity it does keep falling on us it has its own damaging effects but not to an extent that we cannot live anymore on the other hand visible spectrum which looks beautiful and colorful here is something that we use all the time for calorimetric measurements uh, if you are trying to see what is a ph you use a certain dye that changes color in different conditions and from the visual perception itself 
you will be able to predict what is the pH. I'm sure all of us are familiar with something like that. In fact, you are actually using some part of EM radiation, just that you are not using a separate uh, uh, source and a detector. Your eyes are the detector and the source comes from natural sunlight. So basically, you are using uh, spectroscopy at that point. IR radiations are not visible to the human eye, but you can actually feel it. You can actually perceive it in terms of heat. Whenever you leave an iron box out, you, when you go close to it, you will be able to feel the heat radiations that are present. Uh, so basically, th those are also used in spectroscopic ways to analyze a given molecule. Microwave, I'm sure, has also become an uh, everyday commodity in all our houses where we end up using that to heat the food that we end up eating. Next comes the interesting set of uh, energy range, which is uh, very useful for us. And this is exactly where NMR operates. I'm sure all of us are familiar uh, in listening to radio stations, FM radio and AM radio. AM radio is nowadays less popular than FM. I'm sure all of you listen to the FM radio. Here, I would like to emphasize that nuclear magnetic resonance or the magnetic resonance imaging spectroscopies or uh, imaging processes end up using these radiations, the radio waves, which are of very low energy, which end up giving the necessary EM radiation. And I'm sure all of you are ready to accept that FM radiations are always around us. That's why when you keep a radio, you're able to listen to the music or somebody talking. And you perceive that that doesn't affect your health. And therefore, these are very safe ways of using it. So what you are able to realize is that NMR spectroscopy that uses radio waves as the EM radiation are extremely safe. And that's why instead of getting an X-ray, if, if you require something, and if it's feasible with MRI, people suggest you to take an MRI scan over X-ray scans. Now, we have spoken enough about spectroscopy and the EM radiation. Why don't we take a look at some molecules that we are quite familiar with and try to understand how different radiations end up interacting. I'm not showing a UV visible spectrum largely because I'm sure that in the undergrad or postgraduate lab, you would have used a UV visible spectrophotometer to look at a spectrum that would have looked a little broad like this, a plotting wavelength um, and intensity in the X and Y axis respectively. So that's exactly why I'm not showing such an example. I'm sure you have also heard of the beer lambert salah So I'm not showing you a spectrum. OK, now, what you're able to see here are one of the molecules that we like a lot, sucrose. And I did tell you to start with, depending upon the radiations that you use, you end up interrogating with different energy levels. Uh, I couldn't get a microwave spectrum of sucrose, but even if I got it, it would have been very difficult to understand. So that's exactly why I'm not showing it. But there are some common features that I would like to highlight on a spectrum before going into NMR spectroscopy. The common things across spectroscopies are you always have an x-axis that is defined by an energy term. And for microwave spectroscopy, it's actually in frequency in gigahertz. And there are some places where centimeter inverse might end up being used. And uh, for Raman uh, and IR spectroscopy, it's almost always centimeter inverse. And for NMR, it's a little confusing. And we use a term called PPM, which I hope to explain as we go forward. Although it looks like a concentration term, it's nothing but a relative energy scale. So we still end up plotting uh, the energy scale along the x-axis. So in respect of any spectroscopy that you end up using, be it UV visible, NMR, a microwave, or any of the vibration spectroscopies, you always have the energy in the x-axis scale. And the one that comes up in the y-axis is nothing but something like intensity. I'm not going to go much into the detail of what is the intensity and why does it come up. But overall, all spectroscopy has intensity uh, transmittance or something of uh, similar units, absorbance, relative absorbance, fluorescence on the y-axis. That is what is the readout that ends up coming. So let me erase all the markings so that it's clear. Yes, so let's continue. The one I hope you guys remember what is sucrose. Sucrose uh, comes up when you have glucose and uh, fructose put together, or at least two molecules of uh, glucose. So you're going to have C12, H22, O11. So basically, it's C6, H12, O6. Two molecules of it, and you subtract a water from it, then you have sucrose that's being present. Sucrose is a small molecule, as you are able to understand. The 
uh, molecular weight will be less than 500 Dalton, meaning that it's a small molecule. And what ends up happening here is that when we interrogate using different spectroscopy, so let's start with the vibrational spectroscopy. What vibrational spectroscopy does is to test what is the strength of a given bond. Uh, basically, it imagines each bond is like a spring, and you try to test how strong the spring is. And what do we do when we want to test a spring? We just pull the string and see how much energy that you spend to see whether a spring is strong or weak. That's the same thing that this spectroscopy ends up using. Um, and what you're able to see is that there are different stretching uh, vibrations, stretching and bending vibrations that are present in the sucrose molecule. Of course, the ones that are actually visible in Raman might not be visible in IR and vice versa, making them complementary techniques to understand what vibrations are present. Of course, IR and Raman uses a higher energy, as you might remember, uh, but it still doesn't put up the molecule. It might heat up the solution a bit, but not as much uh, that you might imagine. Now let's go to microwave spectroscopy. So let me write it. So IR and all that looked at the vibration energy levels, vibration energy levels, while the microwave looks at rotational energy levels. As you might imagine, every body that has a three-dimensional structure could rotate across the X, Y, and Z axis. So microwave spectroscopy ends up interrogating what all rotational modes are present. This gets a little more complicated for molecules like sucrose, which is why a small molecule like iodopropane is being shown here. And what you are able to see, many things that you would have learned in your basic chemistry, that you have different types of conformations uh, between molecules, or rather between atoms in a given molecule. In this case, the iodine atom and the methyl group are trans to each other in an eclipse, uh, sorry, in a staggered uh, conformation. And what you are able to see as they are away and as they are next to each other in the gauge conformation, what, uh, whether they are actually present and how much of it is present is actually clearly visible from the microwave spectroscopy. You are able to see specific signatures for the trans conformation, also very specific signatures for the gauge conformation that is being present. I apologize for the information that keeps coming. I really don't know how to turn off that. Uh, so I apologize for that. But anyways, as you come back to it, what you are able to see is that the microwave rotational spectrum is able to pick up very subtle differences in the conformational energies that are present in a given molecule. If you do any other spectroscopy for that matter, it might not be very easy to distinguish something as subtle as a trans and gauche uh, conformational differences. Now, let's go to NMR. NMR spectroscopy is a little more in detail. Uh, anything that other spectroscopies are able to see, for instance, microwave and IR uh, uh, vibration spectroscopy is able to see, NMR can see a little more than that, but of course doesn't give the information that vibration spectroscopy or rotation spectroscopy ends up giving. What it ends up giving is to understand, for instance, this is a proton NMR spectrum, to understand what different types of proton are present. In this given example that I've taken, although 22 different protons are present, if you expand and see this given spectrum, you would be able to realize that you can actually assign every proton in this given molecule to a certain signature that is being present. This is important largely because when you're trying to get a characterization of the molecule, you'd like to know which atom behaves in which way. You might have different CH protons that are present, and if you are able to distinguish these different CH protons using a spectrum, then you have the power of trying to say, when you make a change in this molecule, how does the molecule change or whether the molecule changes at all. So this is where is the power of NMR, which where you get an atomic resolution information that's really present. Let me pause for a moment and take any questions you guys might have. Please raise your hand in the chat so that uh, I can listen to your questions. All right, so I don't see any hands being raised. I'm going to continue. So as I said, let's re re um, recap a little bit on understanding what's a spectrum. Uh, a spectrum gives a molecular fingerprint of the substance you're working with. And the kind of interactions that you end up seeing are the ones, uh, depending upon the electromagnetic radiation that you end up using. Uh, I'd like to take a second break and see how to uh, stop these notifications to come in. 
Uh, please give me a moment. I'll be back in a second. Yeah, uh, sorry about that. I hope now that turns off the notifications. They were coming a little too often than I would have anticipated. No. Anyways, coming back. So as we are able to see, uh, let's recap what is a spectrum. A spectrum is nothing but a molecular fingerprint. And depending upon the electromagnetic that radiation that you end up using, you would be able to see different properties, which is what is explained here, depending upon the source that, you, that is used. And in some of the spectroscopic techniques, even the detector would matter on what you end up seeing. Of course, um, in NMR, that works in a slightly different way, which we can discuss. Or probably Vinesh will discuss later today when he's talking about the instrumentation part. And the property probe is something that you want to choose and you want to see what you would like to learn from the given molecule. There are a, there are a certain set of features from every spectrum that you would like to learn. Uh, the features are, first of all, would be the resonance frequency or the wavelength that you're trying to look at. And that gives a characteristic uh, as I said, fingerprint. When you're talking about the glucose molecule, which has 22 protons, you will actually get 22 resonances. 22 resonances meaning you will be able to get a resonance frequency specific for each proton that you're looking at. If you're looking at carbon-13 NMR, you'd be able to see 12 different signatures. Some might be overlapped or not, but each has its own specific resonance frequency. That is the first information that people would like to get out of it. The next information that people learn from it is something called line width. Some people also call it full width. Sorry, full width at half height or half maxima. So that gives you a certain set of properties on how the molecule is. This is constant for any spectroscopic technique. The next thing that you would like to know is what is the intensity, especially in NMR spectroscopy, the intensity helps you understand how many protons are present for every given resonance uh, frequency. An important aspect of a spectrum is to have something called the signal to noise ratio. Although the resonance that is being shown in this part of the example doesn't have noise, once you see an NMR spectrum, you would be able to understand the spectrum will not look very clean, but will also feature something called noise. Whatever you end up seeing in parts where you don't see signal is attributed as noise. As much as we have our own distractions in life, as I just saw so many notifications coming, um, even a spectroscopy has its own distractions and that comes in form of noise. And the average of the noise and the intensity of the signal helps you see whether a signal is actually being visible in the experiment that you're trying to do. And that is defined as a signal to noise ratio, the intensity of the signal, the average of the noise gives you the signal to noise ratio. And uh, for almost all spectroscopy, you expect to have at least three is to one signal to noise ratio to ensure that you have a signal. And of course, there is something important with the line shape, which I'll not be going in detail in this uh, given lecture because it's a little too complicated. But uh, it suffices to say that if people are able to take a certain line shape, they would be able to understand very important and critical aspects of a a given molecule. Uh, let, let me try to quickly show you. Unfortunately, I don't have an expansion of uh, NMR signal. We're going to have very sharp signals in NMR where the line widths are within, say, one to two hertz uh, for a small molecule. Actually, it should be less than one hertz uh, if you have shimmed well. Uh, but basically, it's very uh, narrow. But on the other hand, you are able to realize for a rotational spectrum of this sort, you are uh, appreciating that the line width is in the order of few gigahertz. You're already able to understand the line widths are quite different. And if you sit and calculate the line widths for spectroscopies that require higher electromagnetic radiation, higher energy of electromagnetic radiation, the line widths will proportionally keep increasing. This comes up uh, due to very many different factors. And that also has uh, uh, its own effects on sensitivity of a spectrum. Interestingly enough, uh, NMR spectroscopy that gives the narrowest of the lines makes it capable 
of getting things at a very high resolution, which is why in the sucrose molecule, the 22 different protons will actually be visible, providing it the atomic resolution. So now that we have seen enough aspects of what's a spectrum and what do we learn from it, let's go a little further. Uh, <clears throat> Oops, okay, let's go a little further. So, NMR spectroscopy is based on a parameter called nuclear spin uh, quantum number. Basically, it is an intrinsic property of a given uh, element in the periodic table, which you will see in a moment. And as I had just mentioned, it falls in the radio wave uh, region, meaning that the energy levels that are separated due to the nuclear spins that are present can be interrogated using radio waves. Many times we will call it radio frequency waves, RF, uh, which once again you will hear uh, uh, Jeet and also Vinesh talk about a lot as we go forward in different uh, sections. And we also just spoke in detail about this. This is a very important aspect for all of us to understand. Uh, the radiations are so harm harmless that it's, it uses the same energy as your mobile phone or the FM AM radio that you end up using. This is common across uh, anything that you use in, in respect of NMR or uh, MRI. EPR does use slightly higher energy going very close to the microwave, but still it's not as harmful as uh, anything like X-ray would be. And the energy levels that we are going to be looking at is the nuclear spin energy levels against electronic excited states, which are used by something like fluorescence or UV visible spectroscopy. We will also try to quickly make an attempt uh, uh, to understand which elements of the periodic table are NMR active and whether isotopes end up giving uh, or having different NMR properties. Before going there, let's have a brief history of how NMR evolved by itself. As I just said, uh, the nuclear spin quantum number was an important, is actually the feature that we end up exploiting to get our spectrum. It was back in 1925 where, let me change the color of the marker, it was back in 1925 where it was understood that the electron spin, electron could actually possess a spin. And if the spin is being present, then it results in something called an uh, angular momentum quantum number. And that results in a magnetic moment resulting in the fact that we could actually exploit it in order to understand the features of a given element. In 1927, it was shown by Pauli and Darwin using theoretical approaches that an electron does have a spin. If you are somebody who understands quantum mechanics, just by using the basic principle, uh, quantum number n, l, and m, uh, azimuthal quantum number and magnetic quantum number, people were not able to explain the different aspects that were observed in spectroscopic uh, uh, interrogations of elements. And uh, Pauli and Darwin were the first to say, actually, we need to introduce something called uh, spin quantum number in order to explain these aspects. And it was actually not until the next six years by uh, where Stern and Gerlach, when they actually did an experiment uh, with, I think, uh, silver foil, uh, that they were able to actually understand, aluminum foil or silver foil, I don't remember right now, where they were able to actually demonstrate that, indeed, electrons have their own spin. And actually, the spin quantum number is half. This was actually a revelation by itself. And followed by that, many people started to attempt whether a nuclear spin could also be observed. And in fact, it was Rabbi, who you see right uh, here, uh, was the first person to actually observe an NMR signal. Followed by that, there were a lot of uh, recognition that was observed, I mean, was given for the nuclear spin. And then people started to, uh, once again, put a lot of effort on uh, trying to understand whether the nuclear spin could be exploited. And it, it was actually not until 1952. I'll be coming to the other effects that we end up uh, uh, talking about not in 1952 where Nobel Prize was actually given for the nuclear uh, phenomenon that was exploited in terms of spectroscopy. But before that, you were able to see Purcell was able to show that one could actually do NMR of the bulk material. I'll try to give a little bit of historical perspective as we go to the basics. And in 1948 and 1950, uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, progress that came up. And in fact, one of the Indian scientists was uh, instrumental in understanding the effects of chemical shift which is one of the major parameters that one ends up using in NMR. And as uh, time went on, people were also able to move on from proton NMR to other nuclei, 
for the first uh, carbon spectrum being uh, acquired back in 1957. And slowly, commercial NMR instruments started to come in 1961 with Varian, a company that is not uh, present anymore. It was acquired by Agilent and it doesn't exist anymore for NMR. It was the first to build a commercial 60 megahertz NMR instrument. Currently, with the current technology, we might assume that 60 megahertz is very small, but the first of its kind already occupied several rooms. So one can imagine how difficult it was to uh, actually build it. And the first, uh, of course, there's something that needs to be said. The first NMR that was uh, done, uh, was uh, developed, was actually using something called a continuous wave mode of uh, evaluation rather than the current uh, techniques that exist in terms of Fourier transformation. So actually, the major, oh, I forgot to say. So this is uh, block, and this is parcel. The people who actually uh, got NMR into the forefront with many physicists also uh, saying that it's a very important technique. Interestingly, one should understand that in 1950s, people did not think that this would be a great technique for one to use to, for interrogating chemi uh, chemical or uh, biochemicals for that matter. So this is important. All the very big people who are very smart try to say that something is not useful. You should not worry about it and you should continue to think whether you can use it in a way that you could learn new things. So uh, this is a small message I want to say. So don't be uh, curtailed by what others say or what literature says. You try to understand the basics and find what it is potential. What, what, the, what is the potential of a given technique and you will be able to find more. Now coming back, Richard Ernst made a huge uh, uh, paradigm shift in NMR by implementing Fourier transform techniques uh, which are much faster and give information that can otherwise not be approached. And this comes from the fact that using the Fourier transformation, uh, James Giener and Richard Ernst, uh, so this, this is Professor Ernst, he was able to show that FTNMR could actually get multidimensional information where you would be able to resolve any degeneracies in the given molecule that are present and you will be able to understand the molecule at even greater detail than you might otherwise end up getting. Um, and then as life went on in 1980s itself, and people are trying to say, okay, this cannot go beyond some small molecules uh, with a lot of uh, guts and valor, uh, Wagner, Gerard Wagner and Kurt Utrik, Utrik you see uh, in the picture here, uh, they were very uh, valorous, I should say, and started to already apply proton 1D NMR techniques to understand how biomolecules look. And it is important to mention that there was another myth that existed in the biophysical community that protein are rigid entities. And I should mention that NMR was a technique which showed that protein are very dynamic entities and the aromantic rings that are present within the core of the protein actually sample different conformations. And it was indeed shown for the very first time by Kurt Utrecht and Gerard Wagner, which made people wake up to the reality that actually conformation dynamics plays an important role in structural uh, biology. And as time went on, as I said, oops, as I said, these are all based on proton or carbon 13 1D experiment. In the 80s and 90s, people started to understand multidimensional NMR, the, like the 2D NMR, going beyond 2D NMR is important. And people started to apply it to the model system BPTI and come up with new hardware technologies that help getting the NMR data in a different way. All these efforts got a further impetus when Professor Richard Ernst was given the Nobel Prize in 1991. And followed by that, um, I should have been careful here, the Y2K problem came up. Basically, from 1990s until the 2000s, a lot of three-dimensional experiments going beyond the two dimensions were actually created by many pioneering scientists, especially by a scientist by name Ad Bax, who was able to give an idea where if you have a molecule and label it in a certain way, you will actually get the uh, data to get the tertiary structure of the molecule in a very simple way. And Utrik, of course, pushed it a little further, Utrik and K pushed it a little further, where they were able to come up with a technique that can actually study large protein molecules. I'll try to emphasize on this point as we go forward. And once again, this got further impetus, where in 2002, Kurt Utrik shared the Nobel Prize for biomolecular characterization using different spectroscopic technique, with Utrik getting it for the NMR spectroscopy. Um, and there is one more side note that I have not mentioned throughout. In 1970s itself, uh, Richard Ernst was able to show that NMR could also be used towards imaging. 
different things. For instance, live or inanimate objects. In 1780s, it was inanimate objects like a fruit or something like that. But uh, people like Paul Lauterberg was able to take this technique forward and they had come up with uh, MRI. And MRI uh, related Nobel Prize was awarded in 2003. And as you are able to see already, a number of Nobel Prize has been already awarded to the idea of nuclear spin and its exploitation in chemistry and biological purposes. And where do we stand right now? 2000 until now, for the last two decades, NMR has focused on a large range of biomolecules and has extended its own self across many different important problems such as proteomics, metabolomics, and also uh, uh, RNA-based transcriptomics and many, many uh, aspects of itself. Definitely, it has contributed quite a bit in understanding the structure of biomolecules. And most importantly, it's giving a lot of impetus where people are trying to characterize the biomolecular uh, conformation dynamics that are present and which are being attributed towards the function of the molecule. Let me pause for a moment. In case anybody has questions, please raise your hand. In the moment, I'll have a little bit of water. All right. So many of the illustrations that I will end up using in this uh, lecture are actually from a textbook by James Keeler. This textbook is available for free if you go to this certain link. Uh, or even if you search in Google James Keeler NMR lectures, you would be able to find his PDF lectures. In addition, James Keeler has been nice enough to have uh, posted all of his video lectures on YouTube in, in, um, uh, in a channel called Antsmag. Uh, just a moment, I'm not sure why my screen is not updating. Are you guys able to see YouTube and Ansmag that I'm writing or not? Yeah, finally. Vinesh, are you able to see what I wrote? Is my voice clear? Yes. Okay. It is visible. Thank you. It is visible. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, I see Anju has asked a question. Sir, which is the most sens uh, sensitive spectroscopic uh, technique, including mass spectroscopy? That's a very good question. To so keep it pertinent to the discussion that we are having here, uh, I'll tell it right away. NMR is the most insensitive technique. And of all the sensitive techniques, probably fluorescence scores the best because you would be able to even get an information from a single molecule. So when NMR ends up using something like micromolar to millimolar concentration, you can go to something like 10 power minus 20 molar. I don't even know whether it's atomolar or allomolar or whatever. So basically, if you're asking a question which spectroscopic is the most sensitive, then I would actually give it to fluorescence. Uh, but then, um, fluorescence doesn't give you the information that NMR gives you. So overall, I always see there is, uh, there is always a compromise between sensitivity and resolution that you end up getting. Techniques that are extremely sensitive average information. On the other hand, since, uh, techniques that are less sensitive give uh, high resolution. Okay, so that's where NMR scores. I hope that answered your question. Uh, so coming back, so you would be able to get uh, James Keeler's lectures and notes from online. So please make the best use of it. I think there's a significant lag uh, in the time that I'm writing something and that comes in the screen. So I'll be a little slow and carefully talk. Oh, among UV, IR, uh, NMR, and mass. Um, in this case, I would say mass followed by UV probably followed by IR and MR. IR might not be able to see everything. Uh, for instance, if you take a molecule that's very symmetric, you may not be able to characterize things at the higher detail. Although it could give you a lot more, you may not be able to see everything that you want to see. Um, it is something like this. It's asking which food is tasty. It's a very difficult answer to give, largely because depending upon your taste and appetite, you might want to eat different things. Sometimes when you're extremely hungry, you won't actually care about the taste and you'll eat a lot irrespective of what is given to you. On the other hand, when you're extremely bored and not very hungry, you would actually expect to eat something tasty and that's what you're looking So spectroscopic techniques are also the same way. You would have to choose the spectroscopic technique based on the question that you're trying to ask. And the place that NMR is able to find itself a unique spot is where you'd be able to get a high resolution characterization of whatever you want to learn from a given molecule that you're trying to understand. So that's where things stand. The other book that goes into significant detail of how NMR works 
is actually the protein NMR spectroscopy book written by John Hanna, who sadly passed away last year. Sad brother Art Palmer. Art Palmer is a pioneer of uh, uh, confirmation. Uh, Mark Kranz and also uh, Skelton. So this book uses illustrations from here as well. But this is a little too involved for beginners. So therefore, um, don't worry and skip these details. If uh, it does get uh, overwhelming for you. Okay, let me go to the next slide. Um, it's going to take a little bit of time. I'm able to see there's a little bit of lag. Okay, there you go. So let's start with understanding uh, what is a bar magnet. Uh, so this is important to understand because every atom that you're looking at that's NMR active behaves like a magnet. And the Earth that we live in has a liquid core uh, which ends up, it's, it's known to, or at least it's speculated to provide a certain level of uh, uh, to the planet. And what you are able to these arrows that are represented here, these are nothing but magnetic lines drawn when you, assuming you leave unit four, how would this unit north pole end up moving? And if you are able to see, this is the geographic and the magnetic north pole, oh, I'm, whatever I'm writing is not coming sure why. Give me one minute. Okay, so what I shall end up doing is to I'll still be online. I'll stop sharing. Come back. Uh, the internet will be slightly better. Just give me one moment. Uh, one of you might have to Yeah, I hope I'm audible. Let me start screen sharing again. Yeah, yeah fine. What happened? I have no clue. Uh, the internet has been extra. Yeah, I started sharing my screen. Uh, Is there people coming? Yeah, no, it's fine. It's being extra. It's a little slow. No, it's no, wait, wait, wait. It hasn't come. Yeah, I see that it doesn't work. Yeah, That's why I always open a session in the laptop so that I can see what is coming and what is not. Just a minute. Yeah, I see that it doesn't come. That's why I open so that I can see what is coming and what is not. Just a moment. Sharing. Let me share again. Okay. Starting now. Okay. Your voice is also Starting repeating up. actually. No, that's because uh, probably Vinesh has the mic on. No, that's because uh, probably somebody Vinesh has the mic on. Once that, somebody gets, no, on. On. Once that gets turned off. No, on. no, no. Oh, I see. No, Bharat, you, you have both of them on. It's my mistake. That's right. You're right. I'm sorry about it. Uh, okay. Now I hope there is no feedback. Good. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Am I audible? Yes, 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 you are audible. Okay, okay. Yeah. sorry. Yes. Uh, let me continue here. So in order to understand the phenomena of new, uh, magnetic resonance, you need to understand how a bar magnet behaves. I'm sure all of you have played with this experiment in your school. Suspend a given bar magnet in any random orientation. And what ends up happening after you let it equilibrate for some amount of time, is that the magnet orient itself in the north and south uh, parallel to the uh, Earth's magnetic field. This happens largely because the orientation that is parallel to the Earth's magnetic field has the least of energies, therefore being the most favorable orientations. However, in the classical world, you can actually have every possible orientation of a magnet, although less stable, it can still be kept in such a position. I'm just giving some example of such a the orientation. Now, when we are going into uh, atoms which have a specific uh, spin quantum number i, in this case, a nuclear spin quantum number i, interestingly, you cannot have all possible orientations. Um, without going into very fine details of it, uh, 
the z uh, component of this spin quantum number is actually quantized along the uh, spin quantum number of a given nuclei for instance you take a spin quantum number of um, half then the allowed m values here are plus and minus half so therefore what it ends up doing only two possible orientations with respect to the main magnetic field will be possible which you will see in about a moment but without going into the further details of uh, quantum mechanics it suffices to say that unlike unlike a uh, uh, classical magnet which can sample every possible orientation when you leave it of course it equilibrate uh, in parallel to the uh, earth's magnetic field for quantum magnets that is not the case and depending upon the spin quantum number only certain states are allowed and similar to the aspect of what you see classically the same thing happens here where the magnetic moment that is driven by the spin quantum number uh, decides which orientations are stable or not as the energy decides energy is decided by this uh, magnetic dipole moment magnetic moment so what you see here is that the magnetic moment is given by the negative of the dot product between the dipole moment and the magnetic field that is applied in nmr we generally apply the magnetic field only along the z axis so you can assume the b b not is along z so when you take a dot product of mu where mu is a vector where you have mu x uh, x cap mu y y cap and mu z z cap when you take a dot product only terms uh, that have a similar component will survive so what will end up happening you will only have the z component that is present and the mu z component is going to be associated with i z which is associated with n quantum number and immediately you are able to see the energy levels that would be allowed are the one that with plus half and minus half with respect to the b not field that is present one of the important aspect that i am not referring to that i am not referred to until now is the gamma which is the proportionality constant between the dipole moment and the spin magnetic uh, sorry nuclear spin quantum number and this is called the gyro magnetic ratio some people are also refer to it as magneto variation as it is the ratio between uh, the magnetic dipole moment to that of the radius of gyration that is present but uh, in nmr people generally tend to call it gyro magnetic ratio so this ratio is specific for given um, element that we are looking at in the periodic table and depending upon the strength of the gyro magnetic ratio the nuclei that have same spin quantum number would have different dipole moment and if you are able to understand if you have different dipole moment the energy between two states that is being sampled by the plus half and the minus half spin quantum number would be quite different and i would like to remind you that as we started this discussion that spectroscopy is nothing but the interaction of uh, light with matter here the matter that we are interrogating is in the terms of the nuclear spin energy levels i i should be careful here and make you guys understand these are not the nuclear energy levels nuclear energy levels are proved by gamma rays which are more harmful than the x rays but here we are talking about nuclear spin energy levels that can be interrogated by the radio frequency waves that we are trying to talk about so let me reiterate what i have told so far we are coming now to the understanding of uh, nmr spectroscopy from its basics where the nuclear magnetic quantum number i by what orientations are possible and upon the new, uh, constant for a given nuclei that is the gyro magnetic ratio the size of the dipole moment changes larger the gamma larger the mu and the direction of the mu could also change if the sign of gamma is positive or negative a moment you have a certain mu that is energy that is experienced by this little nuclear mass is decided by e equal to minus mu dot b where b is applied a uh, field So now that being said let's take a quick look at what are the different gamma magnetic ratios that has been observed for uh, that are commonly studied with nmr i changed my slide but unfortunately it's not updating let me wait for a second yeah now it is updated so what you are able to see here is the different nuclei that we end up perturbing and i is the nuclear spin quantum number that we are trying to look for the gamma is the gyro magnetic ratio that i was referring to 
and what you are able to see is that each one of them have differing magnitudes which helps you understand the size of the vector the moment vector will be different although you are looking at the same proton but depending upon the isotope that you are having the spin quantum number i could be different and the magnitude of the gamma could also be different and most importantly not just that as anju had referred to this the sensitivity of the uh, nmr experiment not only is decided by the gamma and the spin quantum number it is also de decided by the natural abundance that is present if you take any molecule for instance let's just take sucrose from your uh, kitchen then you are going to have 99.99% of proton uh, with the isotope being 1h with just a 0.0 B. So this says that if you take sucrose and want to measure the deuterium spectrum of it, it's going to be about 1,000 times less sensitive than the uh, 1H NMR spectrum. So what I have made you understand right now is that what all aspects decide the sensitivity of the NMR experiment. Of course, I've not gone into detail why a spin quantum number would affect it, but I'm sure you're able to understand that uh, the gyromagnetic ratio definitely decides what is the energy separation. We will see in a moment how the energy separation decides the population that once again drives the sensitivity. In addition, the amount of uh, abundance that is present also ends up deciding how sensitive the technique is. The most commonly observed nuclei in NMR are the proton and carbon-13. This is largely because chemists, when they synthesize molecules, they have CH bonds. And as you just saw, proton by itself is abundant and also NMR active and has a favorable spin of half and therefore this is the most common nuclei that is being observed and the next common nuclei that people follow is carbon-13 largely because that's also spin half and unfortunately because carbon-12 that is present at about 99% of its abundance is, ex is not NMR active it has a spin quantum number of zero therefore you cannot observe it on the other hand carbon-13 has a spin quantum number of Half and has an appreciable gyromagnetic ratio, which is about one fourth of uh, uh, it's about one fourth uh, that of uh, a proton, and uh, this results in the aspect that one can actually observe carbon 13. And carbon 13 is also useful largely because it is present in different functional uh, groups that are present. You could have an aldehyde group, you could have a methyl group, which have different electronic environments, which you'll see in a moment that are very sensitively observed using NMR spectroscopy. And the next commonly observed nuclei in biomolecular applications is actually nitrogen. And nitrogen is present in two different isotopes, one having a spin quantum number of one and another having a spin quantum number of half. The spin quantum number of half is something that people uh, enjoy studying in biomolecular applications. And if you see, that has a gyromagnetic ratio that is one-tenth of proton. And of course, the natural abundance is also very, very low as you go uh, forward. So what you are able to understand here, if somebody wants to do carbon-13 and N15-based studies, what they end up doing is to enrich their molecule. So instead of having 1% and 0.4%, uh, what they will do is to label their sample close to 100% so that you are still able to work with the half of the spin quantum number and be able to observe them in NMR conditions. The other nuclei that uh, chemists love to see are oxygen. And fluorine, fluorine actually is an interesting nuclei which also has spin quantum number of half and has 100% natural abundance. And it is one of the very few nuclei that, have, that has a gyromagnetic ratio very similar to that of 1H. The only nuclei that has a gyromagnetic ratio higher than 1H is tritium, which unfortunately is radioactive and is present at even less than 0.01% and therefore people don't end up using it because of health hazard and also its expense. Uh, and people don't construct the NMR instruments for ratio. And sodium, which is an important salt that's being used, also is being uh, uh, characterized using NMR across very many different uh, cases. And phosphorus that is actually present in nucleic acid and uh, has a favorable spin quantum number of half and has, has a beautiful natural abundance of 100% is also being followed for different biomolecular applications. One simple ex example is given here in terms of cadmium. But there are also other elements such as lithium, uh, tellur tellurium, selenium, anything that you can imagine that inorganic chemists would like to uh, focus on so that they can characterize their molecule. The next slide shows you a periodic table. Yes, uh, Omar has a question. 
Omar asks, sir, what do you mean by element is 100% labeled? That's a good question. So what you generally end up ha having is that let's take glucose for instance. When you're having glucose, you have something like C12H22O11. By default, oxygen is in 16O as an isotope. Okay, if you want to study oxygen, then probably the O70 that's present at 0.04% is what you want. Unfortunately, to get a spectrum at natural isotopic abundance, it takes a very, very long time. As I mentioned, the signal to noise ratio determines whether you're able to observe something or not. So what people generally end up doing, they would actually synthesize the glucose molecule by giving precursors that have 17O. Okay, so once you are able to give 17 o and synthesize, what you will end up doing, instead of having the natural abundance of something like 99.6% as O16 and remaining 0.4% as 17 o you would change this to have about 99% of O17. So this is called labeling for NMR. Okay, and these are all naive isotopes. You are only changing the number of nucleons, which does not change the number of electrons. Generally, properties of any chemical or bio uh, biomolecules are dependent on the electrons, and therefore, you won't change the properties of the molecule, and therefore, you'll be able to see it at a higher sensitivity with the NMR We lost you. Propose that to win. Bharat, we lost you. We, we, we couldn't hear last uh, half a second. I mean, a few seconds. What was that, Dinesh? We, we couldn't hear you for the last oh, I see. few seconds. Huh? OK. So I, I hope now it's a little more audible. I'm really. Now is it audible? Now is it audible? Yes, yes. Hello? Yes. Am I audible now? OK. All right. I think there's a severe voice lag that is coming up. Okay, uh, sound uh, breaking is happening. Okay, all right. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm really not sure how to make this any better. I'm sitting in the Wi-Fi zone. Anyway, uh, if that does happen, please send a message in the chat. I'm seeing the chat from my laptop as well. So now coming back, labeling means if you are able to increase the amount of isotopic presence by chemical methods, then you would end up doing it so as to ensure that you have give a good amount of uh, uh, the isotope that's present for you to study. All right. So so as I just gave you an example, in glucose uh, O11, if you want to study all of them, the 16O is the isotope that's present, which is present at 96 percentage. If you're able to come up with uh, chemical techniques where you're able to introduce 17O into it, then you will be able to study oxygen 17 using NMR. So that is what is called isotope labeling. Now, when you are looking at the periodic table that is being present, almost every element that is present in the periodic table has one or the other isotope that is NMR active. This is a periodic table that has been generated by GEO. And what they are trying to show is that when you have a spin quantum number of half, which is the most favorable spin quantum number that NMR spectroscopists like to see, that's uh, shaded in pink. As you're able to see, you have a lot of pink that is being present, meaning that you'll be able to observe it at a very good sensitivity and a very good resolution. And on the other hand, the spin quantum number just need to be half. It could be one, three by two, 2, 5 by 2, and so on. And those are shaded in yellow and green, where yellow indicates a half integer spin, meaning n by 2 type of integer spin. And green indicates an integer spin, meaning two, 1, 2, 3, and so on and so forth. And what you are able to immediately recognize is that across the periodic table, even for example, something like silicon, one is able to have an isotope which is studyable. So therefore, if somebody wants to study uh, semiconductors or chips or something, it is indeed feasible using NMR. And actually, there is a talk today after Vinay finishes by 5 o'clock where uh, uh, Professor uh, Claire Gray will be talking about how solid state NMR is used to study lithium ion batteries. So basically, NMR is applicable across the wide spectrum that one would like to study across, say, small molecules and biomolecules. Now, let's go back to the nuclear magnets that are present so that we understand a little bit of basics. As I said, when you have a spin quantum number of a half, the allowed values of the m is plus and minus half. So therefore, what ends up happening, the projection that is 
decided by the IZ quantum number is given as m h cross. h cross is nothing but the Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. It's basically the unit of the quantum that we end up talking in quantum mechanics. So if you remember, the energy was given by minus mu dot b. And when you end up simplifying gamma b naught i z, where b naught is a magnetic field strength, and gamma is the paramagnetic ratio. And the IZ decides what energy levels are present. So M being half, you're going to have plus half H cross. If it's going to be minus half, you're going to get minus half H cross. So due to which, let's assume uh, gamma is positive for the case that we're talking about, for the case of protons. So what ends up happening, this is the plus half state. If this is the main magnetic field that is applied. This will be the plus half state, and this will be the minus half state that is present. There are a few important things that you should note. If you realize, unlike a regular magnet where you can have different types of orientation, every possible orientation, a quantum magnet can only have the two specific orientations that we are talking about. It can either have something that kind of parallel to the main magnetic field or anti-parallel. These are not directly parallel or anti-parallel. They subtend an angle of 54.7 degrees, but some textbooks or basic things might say, oh, this is the parallel orientation and this is the anti-parallel orientation, meaning that the plus half is the parallel orientation and the minus half is the anti-parallel orientation. And the moment you go to spin quantum number of one, which is what is shown uh, immediately in the next cone after spin quantum number of half, what you are able to see is that three possible orientations come up. One is the spin quantum number of one. Another is the spin quantum number of zero. And finally, the other spin quantum number of minus one. I think it's a little slow to update. Let me wait until it updates. Yeah. So what you're able to see, there are three possible orientations that start to come up. What you're able to realize now is that as the spin quantum number increases, you start to sample more and more space across uh, the entire possible space that's present. A spin quantum number of half can have only two. On the other hand, spin quantum number of one can have three. Spin quantum number of three by two will have four, and so on and so forth. So therefore, if you have spin quantum number that's extremely high, every possible orientation will come up. The one that is aligning itself more or less parallel will be the low state. And in anti-parallel comes up to a higher energy state. Once again, there's a little bit of a lag between what I'm writing and what is showing up. So I'm talking about the E1 and E2 states that are present. The one that aligns itself more or less parallel will have a lower energy state E1. The one that aligns itself anti-parallel will have a slightly higher energy state E2. And that's largely because of the minus mu dot B that we have gotten introduced ourselves to. Now when you have two energy levels, you would be able to do spectroscopy such that the populations in these two energy levels will be different. And if you are able to apply an electromagnetic radiation that ends up distributing these populations, you'll be able to get a spectrum and therefore you're able to study the uh, uh, molecule. Now, the moment we uh, talk about two energy levels that are present, E1 and E2, for the spin states that are uh, present for a spin half system, you would immediately understand the population P1 and P2 in these two states, or as it said, uh, N being Nm by N is a population, a fraction of population we are talking about uh, that is present in the system would be determined the end of each of the states. Without going into very much details of what it is, the Boltzmann distribution decides what is the population on each of the states. And if you slowly follow this map and apply some approximations, where it's called the high temperature approximation, you would, re and of course, and also using the Taylor series expansion for exponential functions, stopping it with the linear, uh, 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 linear expansion, what you would realize is that the energy difference would be determined by the B naught field that is present. Why the solubility of the picnic is like B naught mm -hmm. 
the due aspect. Just a serious habit. Um, okay, there's also voice. Okay, Let's see how to deal with this. Uh, I'm logged back in. No, I, I went silent. I went silent so as to make sure there are no uh, confusions that's happening. Is my voice better now or is it still breaking? It's fine. No, it's fine. It's fine? Uh, Previously, we yeah, lost uh, some. Jimmy does this. Okay, so let me repeat some of the things that I might have told. I really apologize for these technical difficulties. I have an internet that's decent enough, but then it suffers from all of this uh, thing on my scope. Uh, so basically, what we are able to see here is that the population difference or the population in a given state, Nm by M, is decided by various factors, B0 being the external magnetic field, the uh, spin quantum number M, the diamagnetic ratio gamma, and people might want to imagine uh, that it also depends on temperature. But importantly, when you sit down and do the math for uh, different quantum numbers, I being, let's say, let's take half, where m can be plus and minus half, you would realize that the B naught plays an important field, uh, uh, imp important uh, uh, place, uh, important role, I'm sorry, where B naught of something like 60 megahertz, which was initially implemented, and something that you have in Trivandrum or even in any other university, something like 400 megahertz or 700 megahertz, would give you much better sensitivity. And the spin quantum number, I, of half helps largely because you have lesser number of energy levels. Therefore, a given population is carefully uh, distributed across only two energy levels and not multiple energy levels, giving a higher level of polarization that's determined by the population difference. The gamma, that is the gyromagnetic ratio, since proton has the highest proton, is the most sensitive, followed by something like fluorine and phosphorus and so on. The temperature, although that appears in the denominator here, you would understand that even if you end up using uh, even very low temperatures of 5 Kelvin, you don't end up increasing the population as much, and you end up going into regimes where you cannot uh, acquire NMR. And therefore, temperature is not a variable that's almost often used in order to get uh, uh, better sensitivity. A point that I want to drive with this equation is that you will soon understand that you have 1 in 10 power 5 or 10 power 6 excess that is present for a spin half nucleus like proton in something like a 500 megahertz, uh, uh, this thing. So what do I mean by this? Uh, P1 is very slightly, it's almost equal to P2, and it's only marginally greater than P2, making NMR an insensitive technique. Only when the population difference is large, you will actually have a higher sensitivity. And therefore, I hope this also answers Anju's question from earlier uh, better now. That as you increase the population energy difference between uh, the two energy levels you're interrogating, due to both spans distribution, the population difference will increase and therefore will give you much better sensitivity. So uh, let me take a question here from Taufi, where, sir, why NMR studies are mainly focusing on spin half? I hope this uh, entire discussion has answered a little bit of it, where the spin half or anything above spin half has other undesirable properties. For instance, spin one has three energy levels. Already when you're only having one in 10 power six, if you do the math for spin one system, it's going to be less than this. Therefore resulting in a lower sensitivity uh, due to smaller polarization. And on top of it, what will end up happening? You'll learn something called relaxation effects, which are much higher for uh, spin uh, quantum numbers greater than half, resulting in very broad resonances, reducing the sensitivity factor, meaning that line width will be more, which I introduced to you earlier. And due to these two reasons, people generally tend to study spin half systems and not uh, anything greater than that. But it is definitely feasible. Uh, in fact, the person who inaugurated your society, from what I heard from Minesh, Professor Chandra Kumar, has actually pioneered in spin one NMR. And there are also other people like Samanvita Apal, who works in IIT Jodhpur, who works with spin one systems. So there are people who work with it, and there are a lot of advantages that go with it. Every NMR and the application has a certain level of people and uh, so um, now let me sum from 
we are losing you again some of and that of a uh, yeah i'm able to see that i changed the slide and i'm not able to see the slide change um uh, let me log off and let me come back am i audible right now yeah no yeah. please sir. yeah S -s sorry about it once again the, the internet is extremely slow anyway let me go a little quicker but uh, since i'm going very close to my time um okay so now what are the differences that we learned from the classical picture and the quantum picture is that a bar magnet would align itself in every possible way while a quantum magnet like a nucleus spin has very limited set of alignments that it could have once you have that you have an energy dispersion the one, the moment you have energy levels that are different from each other there is a population distribution that comes there is a population difference between these two energy levels you apply a perturbation in terms of an electromagnetic radiation that uh, changes the populations across these states to give a signal now what i would like to do is to paint a picture on how this quantum states end up behaving like a magnet and for this what i would like to do is to invoke the principles that we have just learned so far as you are able to see when you apply a b not you could have one that has a uh, alignment that's very close to parallel or you could have something that's close to anti parallel uh now we are just talking about a single spin that it, that could end up spending its time either in the plus half state or the minus half state now when you are taking let's say a 1 millimolar solution of the sample you have something to the tune of 10 power 20 molecules so what this results in is that when you have 10 power 20 molecules you have vectors basically each one of them ends up sampling alpha and beta states once again the population determined by the energy levels that is being present so now if you are able to recollect some of the maths that you might have learned when you have a vector in a given two dimensional space let's say x and y it can be resolved into its mutually orthogonal components so let's say the angle of subtendence theta 
our cos theta will be along the x axis and our sin theta will be on the y axis to be able to write this as r cos theta comma r sin theta meaning that you would be able to resolve a certain vector into mutually orthogonal components so similarly each vector that is being present can be resolved into its mutually orthogonal components where along the xy plane you would have vectors spaced equally across and therefore they'll mutually cancel and give no net magnetization on the other hand what will end up happening is that you will have vectors that, that add up along the z axis for the plus half uh, spin and also the minus half spin and the length of this vector will be determined by the population in each of these two states and therefore since you know that p1 is slightly greater than p2 what will end up happening these vectors will destructively interfere to give something like a bulk magnetization that is pointed along the b naught that is the external magnetic field that is applied this magnetization that we are able to generate from a sample is what will be exploited in an nmr experiment where instead of looking at them all in the quantum way you should be able to take this magnetization and be able to move it in order to observe it so why do we have to do this without going into very much detail the uh, maxwell's rules say that only when you have a magnetization that cuts a current conduct, uh, current carrying or current uh, conducting coil you will be able to detect it the problem is when you are having a magnetization that along the magnetic field b not you would realize that this magnetization will remain stationary and will not move and therefore you cannot detect it so what people end up doing in nmr spectroscopy is to somehow get the magnetization uh, perpendicular to the main magnetic field this is the perturbation that we apply the rf pulse that you apply ends up changing this magnetization that is parallel to the b naught and gets it in the transverse plane that is in the xy plane the moment that happens you will see that there is something called precession that happens i'll try to show you an animation so as to understand what is precession it's not my video it's uh, borrowed from the ansbach channel that i was talking to you about the moment the precession happens this main magnetic field be, uh, uh, sorry the uh, bulk magnetization that you have generated will start to process about the xy plane so that it cuts the current carrying coil and this will pick up a signal which signal will be in a time domain fashion when you convert it using fourier transformation you'll be able to get a spectrum so basically i have given you the entire picture of how things work out then you start from the magnetization and what happens when you apply a perturbation as you go forward uh once again this could be done in a very laborious way which might uh, which i might end up skipping right now because for the sake of simplicity this is a bulk magnetization that has gotten developed from your uh, molecule along the external magnetic field that has been applied when you start with in an equilibrium condition the plus half system the state and the minus half state are populated by the boltzmann distribution where there's a small population excess so when you take the difference between these two you have two delta n difference that comes up this is the polarization that you have which ends up deciding the length of the vector now when you apply a rf field which could be done in terms of a 90 degree pulse you could tilt the main magnetization so as to get it on the transverse plane now due to uh, certain things basically what ends up happening the rate of change of magnetization will be given by a cross product of the magnetization to the main magnetic field i would want to go into the details of it which i have in the subsequent slides but that will take a long time i'll just show you some animations to make you understand that when you have a certain magnetization along a given field and if the angle between them is non zero remember it's a cross product cross product goes with sin theta so when the theta is not equal to zero or not equal to 180 degrees what will end up happening the cross product will be non zero and therefore you will actually have a rate of change of magnetization that comes up that is the process that i'm calling called precession the precession motion is nothing but when you have a main magnetic field along a z which is b not this will end up just moving around in circles so i'll try to show you a video right now i hope i can open it and i hope it's also visible uh the audio for this is probably muted so that you uh, might not be able to listen to this i encourage you guys to go and take a look at this video uh this is uh, uh pt callahan uh, professor callahan i think uh and he is one of the pioneering nmr spectroscopists from new zealand 
and he gives beautiful demonstrations to understand different phenomena of NMR. And this is one such demonstration to understand uh, what is uh, precision. And he's trying to help you understand in terms of the wheel. But remember, the wheel only helps you provide a rotational motion while you have to be paying attention on the handles that he has, which is perpendicular to the wheel. So let's take a look at it. So unfortunately, he's talking, which comes in my ears and might not be audible for you. What he's trying to make you understand. Yeah, so the main field is applied along the z-axis. And he's trying to replicate the rotational motion with the wheel that is being present. What is going to end up happening right now is that when he just suspends the wheel due to gravitation, this is just going to go down. OK? There is no rotation. There is no precision or anything of that sort that happens. Just give it one moment. And now, when he's trying to rotate the wheel, let me do it. Yeah. So now he's going to be rotating the wheel very fast. That gives a rotational motion to it. You can imagine this, this is what the nuclear spin ends up going through. Now he's going to suspend the wheel. You're going to see something very interesting happening. Keep watching it. What you're able to see, the handle starts to move about the string that is present. This is called the motion of precision. OK, so he'll, he's going to do a few more uh, animations that start coming up. So let's show, he's going to show it again. Keep watching. He's going to spin the wheel. So he's going to spin the wheel, and he's just going to leave it horizontal to the uh, thread. What you're able to see is that it nicely go, goes around the thread. He's also going to orient it along the direction of the wheel in a moment. And you, I mean, thread, you'll see it going to be quite different from what you have seen before. So let me stop the animation here, and I mean, the video here, and make you guys understand that please go back and take a look at this video. Uh, and, uh, that's available in the channel called ANSMAC. This is the same place where James Keeler's lectures are also available. It's a wonderful, which will help you get started on many things uh, from one of the best teachers you could hear from. So I planned of explaining how this works and how one can understand. Due to want of time, I'm going to skip it right now. Uh, just to go to a reference frame, what we are trying to say is that you have the uh, bulk magnetization that was generated initially which you end up tipping by applying a radio frequency pulse. Now, when you have an effective magnetic field, that magnetization starts to process about the effective magnetic field B. This comes up because of the M cross B that comes in the rate of change of magnetization that you have present. OK? So this is how NMR spectroscopists exploit the fact that the magnetization can be changed at will by applying some radio frequency pulses across any axis, a 90 degree pulse or 180 degree pulse, which you will see when JIT ends up showing you different multi-dimensional 2D NMR experiments, where we carefully choreograph these pulses so as to make sure the spins dance to the tunes that we end up playing. Uh, so these are the simulations I ended up showing. There was one more simulation I had. Maybe if we do have time, we can actually take a look at it again. I'm really not sure how good these simulations are going to end up working. So let me go back to equilibrium. Uh, so what you end up seeing here is that the bulk magnetization is what is shown as a cylindrical gray rod. And then let's say you apply a 90 degree pulse. What ends up happening is that you tilt the magnetization. Remember, the mag main external magnetic field is along the z-axis. And the magnetization that you see is in form of the uh, gray rod or the white rod that you see. And what you are able to understand here, after I had applied the 90 degree pulse, which I just clicked at the bottom, you're able to see the magnetization tilted, presses above the main magnetic field. The moment it starts to press above the main magnetic field, you are able to see on the top right corner, you have a signal in form of the red uh, oscillations that come up. If you are able to record these oscillations, and when you do a Fourier transformation, you actually end up getting a signal. Due to want of time, I'm not able to do more simulations. I can also show you a quick simulation that instead of applying a 180 degree pulse, you applied a 180 degree pulse. And all that you have done is flipped the entire magnetization by 180 degrees. And of course, you can keep playing this game where you apply another 90 degrees to see the precision and all that. There are a few more important aspects here.
something called the rotating frame, something that's called the stationary frame. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to go through or the internet is allowing me to show the animations properly. So let me stop this for the time being. And if we do get time, we can take a look at it later. Let me pause for a moment in case anybody has. Bharat, are you around? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I do not know how it went to mute. How long have I been on mute? You were like uh, five seconds, five, five to ten seconds. Okay, five seconds. Okay. I have no clue how that happened. Okay. So I really appreciate the uh, questions that have come from Anju, Omar, and uh, uh, Taufik. So please ask questions. Let me pause for a moment in case you have, guys have any questions. Please raise your hand. Okay, so since I don't see people raising hands, if you raise your hand, I'll stop anytime and answer your question. So now let's uh, keep going forward. Uh, there is also an important thing that comes in terms of relaxation. I'm sure all of you guys have played with pendulums when you're smaller, meaning that you move the bob of the pendulum uh, to one extreme. Let's assume you, uh, this is the pendulum that you have. I'm sure you take the pendulum to one end of the side and you suspend it, then the pendulum keeps oscillating uh, one side versus the other, and slowly the pendulum comes to rest over a period of time, right? Those are the same kind of oscillations you saw in the NMR signal as well. After you have perturbed the system, what will end up happening is that the oscillations that you keep seeing will slowly get mitigated, and that process is called relaxation. And interestingly, in NMR, the loss of signal that comes in the transverse plane and the recovery of the magnetization along the z-axis follow different rate kinetics. For people who do chemistry, this is obvious. This is nothing but uh, first order rate kinetics. These are proposed by Bloch, and they're therefore called Bloch equations. And as you're able to see, the rate of decay of the x and y transverse magnetization is depending upon the concentration or the length of the vector in the transverse plane. On the other hand, the recovery of the longitudinal magnetization is based on the deviation from the equilibrium magnetization, which is given as m naught. So these two are characterized by different time scales, and therefore the longitudinal magnetization is characterized by T1, while the transverse magnetization uh, relaxation times is characterized by T2. What this results in is that the transverse magnetization dies very quickly, meaning that your signal is acquired in the period of, say, for small molecules in one or two seconds, while the transverse magnetization T1 is in the order of two seconds, and therefore will take about five to 10 seconds for it to recover. So whenever NMR is being repeated, we actually tend to wait for a longer time for every signal that uh, can be acquired for a given scan. And this is important because as I just said, NMR is an intrinsically insensitive technique. Therefore, we adopt the signal averaging such that we will do multiple scans, add up the signal that ends up coming in order to improve the signal to mass ratio. As I said, due to the want of time, I'm, I do not have enough time to explain all these concepts, but I'm sure there will be other time and other lectures where you will hear more about it. So Asha has a question. Sir, now it is clear that we can apply a 90 degree or 180 degree RF frequency. It's not RF frequency, it's called an RF pulse. Uh, can we apply RF frequency gradually changing from 90 degree to 180 degrees? This is a fantastic question. And unfortunately, we don't have the time to answer it, largely because there are definitely uh, pulses that can work in such a fashion. And in fact, there are pulses that work as a 90 degree in a certain frequency range and some other degree pulse in some other frequency range. And uh, the, this requires a lot of basics for us to teach. And hopefully in the future, we will have pulse techniques as one of the tutorials that we will end up teaching. And then we will learn more about this. Yes, uh, to answer your long story short, it is indeed feasible. But unfortunately, with the scope of introduction I'm giving right now for a common audience, this is not easy for me to explain. But take it from me that we can actually discuss further as we go forward. So now coming back, I'll just summarize everything that has been learned in this uh, slide where we talk about the signal, where the magnetization that is acquired in the transverse plane is what we acquire as signal here. And this signal, when you Fourier transform, you get a spectrum. And the spectrum gives you the resonance frequency, the width, and also the intensity. And of course, also the line shape, which is what are the important parameters for all of us to see in order to characterize a given molecule. 
Now, going back, what you are able to see is that the NMR signal comes up as two different uh, portions. One is the real part, and one is the complex part. This is nothing but, um, and um, th this comes up largely because you acquire signal in, in the complex space. I hope Vinesh would have a little bit of time when he's explaining the instrumentation hardware where we not just acquire the real signal, but you'll also acquire the imaginary signal, which is phase shifted. So one is the cost signal, the other is the sine signal, which when you put together as cos theta plus i sine theta, you get an imaginary signal, which is nothing but e power i theta, which is the kind of form of the signal that we have here, which when Fourier transform will give you a real and imaginary part. And whatever is shown here is the real part of the signal, while in the case of EPR, you might end up seeing uh, resonances that are shown as dispersive for different reasons. That is not, nothing but the dispersive part that you uh, end up seeing. So many of the concepts that I have introduced here is exactly the same for EPR or MRI, where the magnetization that is developed due to the, the nuclear spin or the electron spin that is present is what is being exploited. Okay, Not all the uh, instrumentation goes in the Fourier transform way. Uh, EPR is still done routinely in the CW way, although there are uh, uh, FT ways of doing it. Okay, now that we have seen this, I'm not going to uh, repeat the same thing again. The important aspect that one learns from NMR is something called the chemical shift. As I had told you earlier, the energy axis that is being shown in NMR is shown as PPM that comes up largely because what we end up doing is that we have a certain reference that we have in our system. So let me try to quickly go back. to the sucrose uh, NMR that I had shown earlier. So if you guys are able to see, although I only discussed about the sucrose signal, you have something like a reference that is present. Generally, for small organic molecules, you end up using something, tetra, uh, something called tetramethyl silane, and for water soluble, you use something called TSP, and this helps you find what is the zero frequency. Okay, so this is what gives you the reference frequency that you would like to measure. And any energy that we end up depicting in NMR is represented from the reference frequency. And this is the frequency of interest that you're trying to measure. So basically you take the difference between these two frequencies and divide by the spectrometer frequency. Let's say we are using a 700 megahertz and these two are a few kilohertz away from each other so in the numerator, you'll have something like 3 kilohertz divided by, let's just take for an example, 300 megahertz, 300 times 10 power 6. And what you are able to realize is that immediately you're getting 10 divided by 10 power 6, which is nothing but 10 ppm. You go to the scale of 10 ppm largely because the 10 power 6 that you have uh, is being canceled by this. So the parts per million, the million comes from this aspect, so as to make sure you have numbers that are easily you know, readable rather than having a number as 0.00001 or something like that. So the PPM scale also ensures one important thing that the omega naught, which is given by minus gamma B naught, where gamma is the magnetic ratio and B naught is the external magnetic field strength, irrespective of whichever spectrometer that you acquire your NOR spectrum in, you will be able to get the same PPM for the chemical, for the spin that you're looking for. So this PPM scale, the delta scale is extremely useful so that irrespective of whether you're using a 400 megahertz, a 600 megahertz, a 60 megahertz, the chemical shift frequency is common or is same across any uh, spectrometer you use across the world. Of course, the system has to be same, right? So that being told, how does this parameter help? This parameter helps largely because let's take a given molecule like H2O. In H2O, you have two protons that are present. Although you have two protons, these two protons are chemically equivalent. So what do I mean by that? If you just substitute one of the protons with deuterium, you would realize that replacing either of the protons gives you the same molecule. So therefore, water is only going to give you a single resonance. But on the other hand, for that matter, let's also take methane. Methane is also going to have four CHs. And since all the CH bonds are same, and if you substitute any of them with the deuterium, you're going to get the same chemical entity, implying that each of the proton that's present in methane is identical. You're going to get one signal, NMR signal. Let's complicate our life and put these two together where you have methanol. The moment you have methanol, you are able to realize substituting in this proton versus this proton, 
will give different mo uh, molecules altogether one will be a ch3od while the other will be a dch2oh so if you give the iupac name you would realize that these are not same uh, chemical entities although these are isomers of each other but they are not the same uh, uh, so therefore what you are able to realize is there are two uh, chemically inequivalent protons nmr is a technique which can which is fantastic at picking chemically inequivalent protons so therefore what is going to end up happening you are going to get two signals one signal that comes for oh one signal that comes for the proton that's present in the metal group this is the intensity and this is the delta scale that we are trying to plot there is an important thing that i would like to mention here as i told you these are non degenerate states so the methyl protons will have two energy states of plus half and minus half and the hydroxyl proton will have its own plus half and minus half and therefore they are going to give two separate and the energy difference between the methyl protons and the oh protons are so different you will actually get a difference between them and it has been understood that the chemical shift differences arise predominantly because of the electron uh, density around each of this i'm sure when you are able to imagine the methanol molecule what you end up ha having is something like this where you know that the oxygen has two lone pairs and is known to be electronegative and therefore ends up drawing the electron towards it on the other hand the, the methyl group is known to have a plus i inductive effect which also flushes the proton so what this ends up doing is to have a different electronic environment around the carbon and the a uh, different and electronic environment around the oxygen and due to these differences in electronic environment the protons that are attached to each one of this ends up experiencing different fields uh, around them to give a different set of resonances as you are able to see we just started from water and we have gone to methanol already nmr is able to give you so much differences that end up coming let's complicate our life a little bit more and understand how ethanol would be you are just increasing complexity one at a time and immediately what you are able to understand this is one type of a proton this is another type of a proton and this is yet another type of a proton and if you take a look at meta ethanol you are going to get three resonances that come up one for the ch3 one for the ch2 and one for the oh this is the delta scale and this is the intensity an important thing one has to understand you have three of the methyl protons two of the methylene protons one of the hydroxyl protons so therefore if you integrate these resonances you will actually get 3 is to 2 is to 1 if the experiment has been set up properly okay this is an extreme advantage of nmr where you are able to identify chemically inequivalent protons or spins and you are also able to find the relative concentrations of how much is present from the integral and as we go forward you will be also able to understand there is something called scalar coupling which will give you even more information of how many neighbors are present i hope i have given you a picture that even for such a small molecule nmr gives you an abundance of information so this are the splitting that i was talking about what will end up happening for the methyl group you you get something called a triplet we'll try to explain why that comes as a triplet and for the methylene you're going to have something called a quartet and for the hydroxyl proton depending upon the uh, situation depending upon the situation he logged himself out i think i'll call him uh no i'm back i'm back i'm sorry okay. but, uh, once again internet got cut i'm extremely sorry oh. Perils of being in the pandemic. I wish uh, all these problems would have been avoided had we been doing it in person. But unfortunately, this is all we can do right now. I'm sorry about it. I hope I'm audible right now and my screen is also visible. Yes, you, I, okay, we can great. see your screen. Yeah, I see that I have only ten minutes left. I'll make sure I'll finish it within time. So what you are able to see here, I hope I'll get five minutes for the technical difficulties that we went through. Anyways, now coming back. Uh, so what we are able to realize is that. each of this uh, uh, proton comes in a different chemical shift the methylene uh, methyl comes at 1 ppm the methylene comes at 3.5 ppm and the hydroxyl comes at something like 4.8 ppm of course this also depends upon the solvent when you change the solvent from something like um, dmso d6 to cdcl3 
uh, or for example d2o or even meat ethanol i mean uh, d6 ethanol you're going to see the chemical shifts ends up changing for the ones that ends up hydrogen bonding which also indicates nmr could help you understand which uh, protons end up interacting with the solvent okay so one gets a lot of information from nmr spectroscopy of course uh, there is no life without taking it to the biomolecules i'll quickly complicate our life uh, although ethanol and all that were very simple molecules the moment you go to something like a polypeptide for people who do not know what's a polypeptide a peptide is one where you have a, 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 it's a zwitter ionic type species where you have a carboxylic group and an ammonium group that are attached to a tetrahedral carbon which also carries a side chain uh, which is given as r and a proton the carbon is called the c alpha proton the uh, proton is called the h alpha and what ends up happening is that you form amide bonds between uh, the cooh and the nh3 groups to form a polypeptide as shown here and this polypeptide could fold into different ways and the example that is shown here if i remember right is uh, bpti which has a three time helix also where you have beta sheets and alpha helices um, which form different types of hydrogen bond and they have a certain spatial orientation and all that and what uh, i'm able to show here is that this is a molecule that is about 6.5 kilo dalton which is quite big and has about i think 400 uh, protons that are present the simple nmr spectrum that you saw earlier now is immediately complicated where you have so many resonances that are present i'm sure you are able to understand and appreciate that oh god the moment you go to larger molecules it's going to be little difficult to understand but thankfully we have uh, james jean or anons to have come up with multi dimensional nmr technique techniques where uh, utrek and bags and other pioneers of nmr have come up with multi dimensional nmr which i'm sure you'll hear more from uh, jeet so that we can actually characterize these kind of molecules when you do such multi dimensional nmr experiments you'll be able to precisely get carbon and proton chemical shifts i'm just giving you an example of a protein although you ended up uh, having such a messy way of uh, getting resonances when you do isotopic enrichment and when you do a multi dimensional nmr you will actually be able to clearly understand which type of amino acid you are looking at and not just assigning one of its proton you would also be able to assign many of its side chain uh, that are present so this way the chemical shifts help you get an atomistic characterization of not just a small molecule you are working with but also the biomolecules that end up being present so now going to the other thing for scalar coupling that i just briefly mentioned you might immediately ask why did you get three resonances uh, splitting with four resonance splitting where you didn't get something here the case of hydroxyl i will not be discussing right now because it's a little more complicated uh, but i can easily explain what happens with the ch3 and ch2 so let's first draw the chemical structure of these entities what is being present here is that for the methyl group methyl protons that i'm circling in red they have two methylene protons as neighbors if you remember for a single spin half system we said it can be split into plus half and the minus half energy levels for the sake of simplicity people generally write them as the alpha and the beta energy levels now when you have two more protons that are present you get another bunch of uh, alpha and beta states which end up mingling with each other so therefore what you end up having is four set of energy levels alpha 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 beta beta alpha and beta beta now what this ends up doing for just two spins that are uh, uh, yeah the spins that end up coupling let's say you have um, let's say you have a system where you have a ha and hb you have one proton that's coupled with one this has an alpha beta state this has an alpha beta state once they mix you are going to get four energy levels that end up coming depending upon uh, their uh, scalar coupling the energy levels would be different on each of this magnitude and therefore you can have different single uh, quantum transitions that end up coming so once this ends up happening you are already able to see for this kind of system if you do a uh, little more math which i am not uh, doing right now is that the h proton will be split due to the hp proton as a doublet now when you are having two such protons that are present this kind of system will get further uh, split into alpha 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 beta alpha beta alpha beta alpha 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 beta 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 alpha beta 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 alpha 
and beta, beta, beta. So quickly, you are able to understand the number of energy levels increase. Thankfully, due to the resolution that NMR offers, you can actually map each one of these transitions. And for a spin half system, the formula works out in such a way that where, where I is the spin quantum number, N is the number of protons, uh, this formula helps you understand what is the multiplicity that comes up in terms of splitting. Okay, so where N is the number of protons. So for example, let's calculate for the CH3 protons, N is two because the neighbor is a CH2 and the spin quantum number of half and you have the two that comes up there. Half and two cancel, you have a two plus one, that's three, so, which is why you get something called a triplet. And this triplet also has a certain characteristic where the intensity of the triplet will be one is to two is to one. And then the intensity of the quartet applying the same uh, two and a plus one you'd realize that you'd come up as one is to three is to one, okay? So not just in terms of fine splitting, in addition, even the type of splitting that you get, you'll be able to know what kind of a neighbor is being present. There are cases where you could have a spin one neighbor that is present. Somebody asked, what if we do NMR with a non-spin half system? So you will actually be able to see all that inf information and find such structure splitting. I hope the last 10, 15 minutes have made you understand the influence of uh, the chemical shift and scalar coupling in order to get uh, atomistic insights into the molecule that you're trying to probe. So this is the example I was trying to show. So when you have two uh, systems that are being present, it's going to be split. And if you have systems that are involved in a different fashion, you could actually further split, uh, split a given multiplet and so on and so forth. As I said, due to lack of time, I don't have, uh, uh, I don't have the time to go into details. And these scalar couplings, have been shown by Martin Karplus, who won the Nobel Prize, if I remember right, in 2013, um, that this could be helpful in understanding the dihedral angle between the atoms that are involved. For instance, in, in a biomolecule like a protein, you have a proton that's Hn, which is the amide proton, and the H alpha that are separated by three bonds whose uh, scalar coupling is measurable. And it has been observed the scalar coupling changes as a function of the dihedral angle. And interestingly, when you have different types of alpha helices, either the right-handed one, which is the more conventional one, or the left-handed one, the torsion angles are different, and one could actually map them by trying to see what are the differences in scalar coupling that come up. On the other hand, the beta sheet that could either be formed in an anti-parallel or a parallel fashion also end up having subtle differences, although that they could end up facing some degeneracy, but in cases, one should be able to also use these dihedral angles in order to get structural information. Of course, this is an illustration from a different textbook that I didn't say. There's also a wonderful textbook that you should consider reading. Okay, I think I'm getting to the conclusion of this. Uh, we spoke about the line width of uh, NMR resonance, and that's decided by the uh, T2 rate, the transverse relaxation rate of uh, the spin that you're looking at, the full width at half maxima. And the transverse relaxation rate is in, D, in turn uh, decided by the tumbling times of uh, the system that you're looking at. Tumbling times in the sense like how quickly does a molecule tumble by, by its own self in solution uh, in an isotropic fashion. And that in turn is dependent upon the radius of the molecule, the viscosity of the solution, and the temperature that you end up employing it. So therefore, as the molecular size increases, you would understand that the line width starts to increase, therefore making NMR complicated for larger set of molecules. Trying to do NMR for viscous solutions, for instance, you have a highly salted buffer and you're trying to do it at lower temperature, you know that uh, the viscosity of water decreases exponentially as you decrease temperature. And then therefore, the tau C once again increases, the tumbling time once again increases. And if you're reducing temperature, once again, the tau C increases. So therefore, people tend to do experiments for large molecules quite often at higher temperatures the molecule is stable. Uh, and of course, although these are these might be looked upon as drawbacks, these are also extremely useful so that we can see how the molecular size changes using such uh, parameters. And of course, these two pose a limitation for larger size molecules. Thankfully, there are ways in order to alleviate such problems that come up. Uh, in addition to just trying to say that uh, these kind of uh, relaxation rates uh, cause a broadening, they're also extremely helpful in characterizing something called conformational dynamics. The classic example was already seen in 1950s 
where when people took N and dimethyl formamide, which is what you're seeing here, uh, it, it has a peptide bond, which is like more uh, in resonance uh, with uh, the CO that you're able to see, the lone pair is in resonance, which results in being a one and a half bond type characteristic. But if you are at a higher temperature, these two methyl groups keep exchanging positions to get a single, give a single resonance. On the other hand, as you keep cooling it a little by little, what ends up happening, the resonance phenomenon is more pronounced such that the methyl groups start distinguishing each other. And at the very low temperature, you will be able to see these two methyl groups that are well distinguished. The chemical shift difference comes from the fact that one of the methyl groups is closer to the oxygen, that is cis to the oxygen, the other methyl group is cis to the hydrogen, resulting in two different chemical shifts. Once again, this emphasizes the fact how sensitive NMR is to the chemical structure and the environment of the electrons around the spin set you're trying to look. Interestingly, if you do it as a function of temperature, you would actually see interesting characteristics of the line width, which would be helpful for you to characterize something called the exchange, which is given by the sum of the forward and backward rates. So this helps people understand how the kinetics of conformational exchange could work, and this has been exploited in the recent past to a large extent. In most of the cases, unlike this case where the population of the both states is 50%, in biomolecules, people generally tend to observe a skewed landscape, meaning that if there are two populations that are in conformation exchange, instead of having an equilibrium that looks like uh, equally spaced, I'm guessing my voice is getting broken, it's going to have a skewed equilibrium where A tends to be in forward equilibrium with B more than with uh, B being with A, so, or rather the opposite I've written. Uh, let me erase this, just a moment. The scenario that we are trying to look for here is A is more in equilibrium than B. So therefore, the intensity of A is going to be more than B, and assuming that they are in different states, chemical shift would be different, and depending upon their exchange time scale, you would actually see the same spectrum looking very different from each other. And people have exploited this very fundamental aspect in order to see the minor populated species. And I must mention here that this is one of the unique hallmarks of NMR, where something that is invisible to any other spectroscopic technique can be seen in NMR. As low as one, actually 0.1 to 1% population can actually be observed using these techniques. Once again, hopefully we'll have tutorial sessions in future where somebody will be explaining these aspects. Just to quick, give a quick overview, which Jeet will be doing more, and how is this done, is that the chemical shifts that look very beautiful in the case of sucrose, the moment you go for a protein, ends up uh, becoming extremely crowded. And this becomes crowded due to different reasons, largely because you have more number of protons that are present, and also the lines that become broader. So those two are the main reasons due to which uh, you would have loss of sensitivity. So what people are able to do is to resolve them into two-dimensional NMR experiments. So, so although protons occupy a similar space, the other dimension, which is orthogonal in terms of carbon and nitrogen, help you get very beautiful sensitivity. Without stealing much of uh, content from JEET, I'll stop uh, right here. And this could be used for studying biomolecules. For instance, as you're seeing here, this is an 80 Watson and Crick base pair. If it does get switched to a different base pair called the Hoogstein base pair, one can actually do 2D NMR to atomistically characterize what changes end up coming. Uh, without uh, uh, doing, uh, I mean, taking much of time as my time is almost done, uh, let me try to draw a little bit of picture and connect the different talks that have been sensibly put in this uh, workshop. I say this largely because it's very difficult to come up with a workshop that's coherent. And in fact, that has been done by uh, this Magnetic Resonance Society. Uh, the introduction that I've given for NMR spectroscopy can easily be applied to electron spin or ma uh, paramagnetic resonance, EPR. Largely because even the electron spin is half. The only difference is the gyromagnetic ratio of electron is much, much, much greater than that of a proton. It's about 667 times better than that of a proton. So this clearly indicates that EPR is far much more sensitive than NMR. And uh, people tend to use microwave radiations to uh, test what ends up happening. There are two talks later tomorrow, 10, uh, 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Please attend where EPR will be introduced and uh, how EPR is applied to different different uh, systems also we're going to be spoken about. Followed by that, we are also going to have wonderful talks on magnetic resonance imaging. 
where the main difference between a spectroscopic technique and imaging technique is uh, trying to understand how the shape of something looks. Uh, and the concepts of the magnetization that I just showed you will be the same and people will explain the same thing. We're going to hear basics of that from um, Professor Jagannathan in, um, I think, the day after tomorrow or something like that. So please be on the lookout and enjoy. The same concepts that have been introduced will also be uh, uh, exploited in solid state NMR, where uh, the advantage that solution state NMR enjoys in terms of isotropic tumbling will not exist uh, for solid state NMR, but how is it alleviated will be uh, discussed to you with, uh, by Professor Rajit Kumar from NCL. So with this, I would like to stop uh, by generally showing some images that look beautiful so that it can excite people. Uh, on some of the projects that I've done, uh, one of my earliest master's projects when I was doing my post-graduation uh, is to apply magnetic resonance spectroscopy to look at chemicals that are present in sweet lime. Um, and we want to understand how sweet lime, after having been harvested, ends up ripening in different stages. As you're able to see, these are the magnetic resonance MRI images of sweet lime, and we picked up a small volume element and did NMR within that volume element. These are the sugars that are present. This is the citric acid that are present. That is present in the sweet lime. And we followed it over a period of one month to understand how the ripening changes for such a molecule. And during my PhD, I focused more on how aromatic rings that are present in proteins end up behaving. And also solving structures of uh, protein molecules using NMR. My major interest, as uh, Vinesh rightly pointed out, is in terms of methodology development, in terms of getting NMR data in a rapid way. In this aspect, I have developed two techniques. One that uses spatial resolution in order to get protein NMR data in a fast way, and also uh, come up, coming up with a frequency selective excitation so as to get 2D NMR information within 10 to 20 seconds. NMR, uh, 2D NMR generally is a little slower but uh, we are trying to make things go a little rapid so that one can actually follow real-time defolding of uh, systems. Uh, importantly, what I'm focusing in my own independent laboratory right now is to understand how NMR can be applied to, uh, to map or characterize the structural and dynamic perturbations of uh, nucleic acids. And in this aspect, I have predominantly worked with DNA damage in the form of N1 methyl DNA, which we found that ends up bending the DNA, which otherwise is expected to be uh, more or less cylindrical or uh, quite linear. And this aspect of bending ends up helping the enzyme to recognize such a damage in the DNA so as to be repaired, uh, so that we don't end up having other complications in life. Currently in the independent lab, I'm looking at epigenetic modifications. Epigenetics are one where, depending upon your life uh, habits, quality, the environment that you live, whether you smoke, what type of food you eat, uh, the genetic information is encoded with little more of spicing up with uh, different uh, moieties, and we are trying to understand how these moieties end up uh, perturbing uh, DNA structures. Uh, more importantly, we are looking at uh, non-duplex uh, DNA entities called G quadruplexes, where four Gs end up interacting with each other to form uh, three-dimensional entities, and using uh, NMR techniques of 1D and two-dimensional NMR, uh, what we have done is to characterize how these systems look. So with that, I actually thank uh, K, uh, the NMR uh, Society from Kerala for, my, for inviting me to give this inaugural and uh, basic lecture. And I hope I have uh, done at least a little bit of justice in exposing and making you understand how a simple phenomenon that starts from element can actually be applied across uh, small molecules and biomolecules and, and probably a very brief introduction and how it can be applied to research. And before I conclude, uh, I would like to also advertise a little bit of what we have in ICER Bhopal. We have 400, 500, and 700 megahertz NMR equipment, uh, all of which are equipped with uh, different kinds of probes uh, to access proton and other nuclei. Uh, and in particular, we also have a 700 megahertz that are equipped with a cryo probe, which Jeet and also Vinesh also have. This is what we end up routinely using for biomolecular characterization. And uh, we, we end up having uh, a uh, vibrant group of people who come from all parts of uh, the country. I'm actually very happy to say that uh, we have uh, had a Carolite in my lab who did master's uh, uh, project with me for one full year. And she has successfully even gotten a PMR of fellowship and is currently working in an NMR lab in ISC Bangalore. Uh, so that, that is my association so far. Of course, uh, uh, not, not, not leaving out uh, Vinesh in this uh, whole loop. Uh, there are many other people whom I know uh, who do NMR. Uh, 
and i'm very happy to be a part of this and i hope i have done some justice please feel free to ask questions um, and i think i started about 5 to 5 uh, minutes uh, later after introduction and 5 minutes due to technical difficulties i finished it within 2 hours and i see couple of comments that are coming thank you for all your good comments asha sabudin and bharti and i see that anju is asking in single crystal xrd i get a new structure around 30 carbons but nmr i got around 60 peaks so very good uh that double number of carbon atoms two or more compounds together but xrd gives single structure sir why does this happen in solution state the isomerizes the compound this is a fantastic question uh this is i should say one of the foremost reasons people who do nmr love doing it so let me go back to this unfortunately i didn't have enough time to discuss yes you are totally correct this could end up happening exactly because of the doubling of the peaks that you end up getting here what you are able to see is that the mb is close to proton here while the mb is close to the oxygen here uh this is very very common in uh, in uh, biomolecular systems i'll ask you a very simple question or even a thought experiment anju if i have to understand how a human being behaves and i'm trying to use a video camera to understand this versus a photo camera right um uh, i can try to explain this in a way where i i hope i don't hurt uh, the uh, emotions of uh, crystallography people if you take a photo camera and take a picture of anju sitting and enjoying a uh, coffee and then trying to say how anju ends up playing volleyball will that help me explain the function of the molecule probably not largely because you'll be sitting relaxed in a chair i will not be able to understand how your hands are moving whether you're serve or you're going to smash right on the other hand nmr has this unique capability of being a video camera where we will actually be following you while you're sitting uh, drinking coffee in your chair and while playing uh, uh, volleyball so what this helps us do is that we will be able to characterize you at different points of time and how flexible you are so as to understand okay now how do you use your hands versus how do you run around with your legs so that is a unique advantage nmr gets and my guess here is that the molecule that you are working with is also con- formationally dynamic and crystallography is known to uh, have effects where only the molecules that are symmetric and can be well packed ends up forming crystals and these crystals are what people end up studying and they assume that is a structure that exists but in reality this is not true this is also acknowledged by crystallographers where there is a lot of polymorphism that comes even for a given molecule and i'm happy that you raised this question the the carolite student whom i worked with uh, in her masters actually we looked at a si- similar single molecule i mean a small molecule where it ends up sampling two states that are in slow exchange we are working on the manuscript and we'll be more than happy to share it once that comes out but basically the long and short answer for you is that nmr would be able to look at conformational isomers much more easier than any other technique that you can find around that's the answer for you anju and i'm i'm thankful for the other people who have also commented uh, me in the read out their names megna malavika elizabeth abiraj krishna priya lakshmi kristina bharat uh, suma mega and anupama thank you very much for your comments now i pass if uh, anybody else has any questions please post it in the uh, comments or please unmute and speak up let me keep quiet for a moment so that you guys can enjoy some peace <laughs> are there any questions thank you hello all right thank you uh, bharat for this wonderful uh, uh, lecture and a very uh, nice one um uh, well, uh, well it, uh, it has definitely helped i i hope it has definitely helped everyone um who has uh, logged in if there are any questions please uh, talk i uh, mean you can directly i mean you can ask here i mean we are, all of us are able to answer any of these questions too uh, so even if uh, bharatwaj leaves uh, uh, me or jeet or ajit or anyone actually you could uh, just uh, let me know if you think about any questions also or you can write to him directly yeah. so basically uh, i see a question from hari prasad he asked unlike proton and nmr spectroscopy the relative strength of carbon signals are not normally proportional to number of atoms generating each one of them why so very good question there are multiple reasons for it 
largely one of the main reasons for it is that proton spectrum that spans generally between 0 to 15 ppm carbon spectrum ends up spanning something like 0 to 200 ppm because there is a lot more uh, sensitivity that comes to the electronic environment because they are directly attached to functional groups and like protons so what this results in is that the pulse the rf pulse that you end up applying doesn't go equally to all of them for instance uh, if i had time i would have told you the flip angle decides the sensitivity for one dimensional nmr experiments and the sensitivity is maximum when you apply 90 degree pulse when you apply a 90 degree pulse at a given carrier position it might not be 90 degrees for the entire spectral width it might be 80 degrees sometimes 60 degrees so this results in a reduction of sensitivity in addition one of the points that i couldn't go through in detail is that we generally repeat the nmr experiment in multiple scans to get improved signal to noise ratio and this repetition comes after something called a recycle delay that's determined by the t1 longitudinal relaxation since the longitudinal relaxation varies for different carbon atoms for instance something like a carbonyl carbon it 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 will have a faster relaxation rate in transverse plane but might not have similar characteristics in t1 on the other hand a methyl group which rotates fast will have a favorable r2 and i mean t2 and t1 and therefore what will end up happening the recovery of the longitudinal magnetization which corresponds to the signal intensity will also be vary right and due to these factors what will end up happening and also remember one thing you uh, when you're doing a carbon one dimension nmr you actually don't get multiplicities due to proton you do something called decoupling in that aspect and the decoupling or even there's something called heteronuclear noe transfer saturated noe where the signal will get boosted based on the upon the number of protons that are attached so due to which what ends up happening a metal group will actually have higher sensitivity due to multitude of reason than a carbonyl carbon so due to this what happens is that the signals that you end up getting are not proportional to the uh, intensity and you cannot count carbons from it so these are the few reasons there are probably few more reasons but within the scope of the lecture i gave these are the three different reasons due to which a carbon you cannot just take the uh, uh, intensity from carbon and say how many carbons are present okay i hope that answers your question hari prasad and in case we uh, close this session and also because of the want of time uh, we have gone like 15 minutes uh, more uh, you guys can always email me um, in um, isabb.ac.in and i actually uh, vinesh suggested this and i'm actually happy to take this opportunity to also advertise uh one of my uh, youtube channel where uh, we have spent a lot of time in discussing uh the intricate uh, this thing of nmr so basically let me try to go there um i had it ready for uh, yeah so if you actually go search for my name you will uh, find uh, my uh, page where a lot of fundamental lectures of nmr of course this will go very much in detail uh you can find all this so there are about i forget right now uh, 40 lectures that are present where a, a playlist has been made all these are quite condensed and i am a teacher who likes to write and explain and as you will see a uh, lot of this will be explained from the basics uh, using a um, lot of tools that we have out there so i would encourage you guys to take a look at it and i am more than happy to discuss or uh, you know answer any of your questions so feel free to email me or vinesh or jeet or anybody who comes up for this uh, uh, seminar to give a tutorial uh, okay so anju is asking a very specific question regarding xrd which i think we can take it after the session anju if you, if you can wait after everybody logs off we can continue talking i don't want to convert this completely to an xrd versus nmr type session because these two are as i said different types of technique uh, techniques depending upon how hungry and what taste you want you need different type of food so are these techniques Uh, so let's not get into that right now. Uh, any other questions on NMR? If not, I'll uh, keep quiet right away. I think Bharat, uh, that is it. Um, there is no further questions. Everybody understood most of it. <laughs> Thank uh, you. <laughs> except like when you lost yourself. Uh, I mean, um, yeah. So. again i thank you very much bharat for um uh, uh for accepting our invitation and uh, being part of this and um, i hope in the future also we have your cooperation uh, and uh, you continue to support us uh totally vinesh i'll definitely be able to support in any possible capacity my only request is to the youngsters who are sitting here uh is to make the best use of the opportunity 
the people who are giving talks not just me everybody whom you are going to listen from are either people who are 20 30 years of experience in the field of research that they are going to discuss in and i've had experience across the world across techniques across the system so make the best use i'm very happy that kerala started such an initiative and I'm, as i said uh, i'm more than happy to uh, be a part thank you dr sunil kumar for inviting and of course vinesh uh, for also uh, making me a part of this thank you very much thank you thank you very much for your very informative talk okay good then i think i will close the session for now and i uh, will meet again at 2 sure